is in and whenever you'd like to start, go ahead. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining the third in a series of online webinars entitled The Trail Ahead, Current Trends and Innovations in the Music Industry. I'm Angie Chandler and I'm Director of the Blue Ridge National Heritage Area and want to welcome you to this third session called Necessity is the Mother of Invention, Adopting New Ways to Connect. This webinar is brought to you by the Blue Ridge National Heritage Area in partnership with our sponsor, First Citizens Bank, and with support from the North Carolina Arts Council. Before we start, just a few housekeeping uh, items. You can see the presenters on the workshop, but we can't see you. Everyone other than the panelists is muted. If you have questions, please use the chat function in Zoom or in Facebook Live. We have folks who are monitoring the chat and we'll be happy to answer, help get your questions um, to the panelists. We're recording this session and we will add it to the Blue Ridge National Heritage Area website, the partner section, as well as the Blue Ridge Music Trails website. For those of you that are on Zoom, we'll be sending you a link to the recording. And if you're on Facebook Live, if you will send your email address through the chat function, then we can send you a link as well. Just a reminder, at the end of the webinar, we, you will have a link to a survey uh, about the contents of the webinar uh, as soon as you close out, and we would appreciate your responding to that. That will give us some really great insight as to how you uh, enjoyed the webinar and other webinar opportunities that we should provide in the future. The Blue Ridge National Heritage Area is a nonprofit organization whose mission is to preserve, to grow, and sustain our natural and cultural resources in the mountains and foothills of North Carolina. A good number of years ago, we partnered with the North Carolina Arts Council to create the Blue Ridge Music Trails of North Carolina. This is an initiative to support traditional music in 29 Western North Carolina's counties and serve artists, venues, and communities to strengthen our homegrown music for present and for future generations. We're all hosting this series because COVID-19 has radically impacted traditional music in our region. And we want to provide you and ourselves some tools and ideas to positively respond to this impact. I would now like to introduce our good friend, Wayne Martin, Director of the North Carolina Arts Council. Wayne. Thank you, Angie. Um, and I can't see you out there, but welcome everybody who um, is joining this webinar. Uh, I just wanna say a couple of things. Back in the 1990s, um, I was working on the, what, uh, a project that became um, Blue Ridge um, Music Trails. It was an amazing experience because um, I was traveling throughout Western North Carolina visiting um, musicians from different communities um, who, for whom music um, was a part of their heritage, heritage. So we had some people who we would go see who did music purely uh, in the home or in their community as part of, it was part of who they were, their cultural identity, and they kind of kept it within their, within their communities. And we also had uh, people um, at that time, musicians who were able to take their music and uh, take it outside the community and become professional or semi-professional. Um, the experiences of those uh, musicians first, when we first gathered that information in the 1990s and later we, we issued a second and a third edition of Blue Ridge Music Trails, there, those interviews with those musicians are, are, are part of that project. And I urge you to, if you ever have a chance to go and, and read those interviews, because when you do, you'll get a sense of um, a, 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 the depth of, uh, of the music in Western North Carolina and what it means to people. As Angie said, though, we're in a situation where everything has been kind of turned topsy-turvy. And the ability of people to 
perform both within their own communities and outside their communities has been radically changed. And um, as we know from the time of the middle of March has, has been severely limited. So I've been interested in hearing the presenters today because um, we're talking about innovation that is, and, and necessity is the mother of an invention, but some of the things that we're going to hear today may end up becoming a part and parcel of how we do things when we come out of the pandemic. So I appreciate um, having the chance to be here and hearing the presenters. Some of them are my colleagues at the Arts Council. Some, some are residents of Western North Carolina. So um, thank you for giving me this opportunity and for it's great for the Arts Council to partner with the Blue Ridge National Heritage Area. They're incredible asset to our state and to our region. I'd now like to turn it over to uh, our facilitator, um, Brandon Johnson, who's part of the Blue Ridge National Heritage Area staff. Brandon. Thank you very much, Wayne. Thank you to uh, all our panelists for being here today. And thank you to each of you who've joined to, to hear what they all have to say. As Wayne said, my name is Brandon Johnson. I'm honored to be working as program manager with the Blue Ridge National Heritage Area. I'm a traditional musician, a luthier, a writer, and a student of Appalachian culture and music. For me, working at the Blue Ridge National Heritage Area with its mission to sustain and promote the cultural heritage of Western North Carolina is a true amalgamation of vocation and avocation. We're very happy to be gathered here with you today as we all face this challenging and unique time in our lives. The Blue Ridge National Heritage Area has worked in partnership with the North Carolina Arts Council to create the Blue Ridge Music Trails, as Angie and Wayne have talked about. Um, so part of these trails are a website and a guidebook connecting visitors with more than 150 musical venues and sites across Western North Carolina. The Trail Ahead Workshop Series is a continuation of that work as we reassess our approaches and best practices in creating and presenting traditional music and arts. For today's workshop, Necessity is the Mother of Invention, Adopting Ways to Connect. We've invited some of our partners to share their strategies and approaches to finding innovative ways to engage their audiences and generate income. Over the next hour and a half, we'll hear from four different guests and then have time for questions. We hope that you can leave this workshop with concrete ideas as well as an understanding that everyone is in a mode of revision as we work to find stability and consistency in this time. We'd like to send our thoughts out to Emily Epley, who was originally going to join us today, but is recovering from an injury and unable to be with us. So we look forward to catching up with her in the future. So uh, if you have questions, please drop them in the chat function on Zoom and Facebook. We have moderators working to get those to me and we'll get to those questions after each panelist has presented. So first off, we start with Carly Jones. She's the Senior Program Director for Artists and Organizations at the North Carolina Arts Council, where she manages statewide grant and fellowship programs for arts organizations and individual artists. She's played a key role in the Come Here North Carolina campaign the Nina Simone Childhood Home Campaign in programming the African American Music Trails of Eastern North Carolina. In her previous work with Arts Together, the North Carolina Association of Music Educators and the African American Cultural Festival of Raleigh and Wake County has given her a unique lens for grants management and community programming. Diversity, equity, and inclusion are a part of her core values. She has led work surrounding ways to make the arts and arts funding more inclusive and accessible across boundaries for all communities and artists in the state and looks forward to continuing this work. All of this has given her an interesting and useful perspective on how artists across many mediums have adjusted to life under the COVID-19 pandemic. We're happy for Carly to be here with us to share some of that now. Hello everyone, thank you so much for having me today. Um, it, this is our new reality, right? <laughs> uh, these uh, virtual meetings and um, discussions, but very grateful to be able to connect with folks um, all over the state 
and I'm very grateful to Blue Ridge Music Trails for having um, the North Carolina Arts Council partner in this wonderful series. Um, so yes, I, I jotted down quite a few notes um, from this roller coaster of a time since we were all you know, sheltering in place. Um, it has been a wild ride for us at the North Carolina Arts Council, as you can imagine, um, as it has for everyone. And we've had to make some adjustments um, to you know, the work that we do and um, so that we can best serve uh, the arts field here in North Carolina. And so a lot of that involves listening, um, a lot of that involves counseling arts organizations through this time and also counseling uh, individual artists through this time as we are also adjusting and figuring out how we can best support individual artists across the state. And that's of all disciplines, that's musicians, that's uh, theater artists, visual artists, um, and then also how we can support um, small organizations all the way to very large organizations through this time. So I think the first thing that I want to say is that um, no matter the size of your budget, everyone is having to innovate right now. Um, from our large symphonies all the way down to our smaller grassroots music festivals, everyone is having to figure out a way to get through this time when we're not able to come together for live performances and um and also connect with audiences and keep that audience alive through this time so um i think the key you know um word for this time is is to innovate to think outside the box and a lot of that, of course, involves um, technology. Um, we're so um, blessed to be able to have uh, technology, some of us to be able to connect um, to audiences. And sometimes we can connect to a much broader audience than we have using that technology. So one of the very first things that we did at the North Carolina Arts Council, um, as, as we all know, the arts industry was was really hit hard, um, similar to the restaurant industry at the very beginning of, of this time when we started sheltering in place. And so we started hearing from individual artists who were trying to navigate you know, um, unemployment um, and applying for that and trying to figure out how they were going to survive. Um, and one of the things that we were able to do, we innovated at the North Carolina Arts Council and created a virtual music festival. This was in the very beginning, <laughs> before a, a lot of the virtual content was happening, um, when we were all just kind of trying things out and seeing what works and what doesn't. And we were able to bring together many um, North Carolina musicians from across the state that we'd worked with uh, in our music campaign, our music campaign, um, which Brandon uh, talked about in my bio, the um, Come Here, H-E-A-R, North Carolina campaign. And that was a music campaign that we had last year celebrating the rich history of North Carolina musicians. So a lot of those musicians that we met through that, where we were conducting interviews, we were having performances throughout the year of 2019, we were able to connect to those same folks and bring them in for a virtual music festival via Zoom. Um, so my colleague Sandra Davidson and I um, and kind of, we were at the helm of that with our partner, um, Culture, um, there it's spelled C-L-T-U-R-E. Uh, um, they're out of Charlotte, so that's the play on words. And so we partnered with this media partner um, to bring together, similar to a music festival that you would go to, it's, it was a three-day virtual music festival, and we had folks like Ben Folds, Mandolin Orange, a neo-soul artist, uh, Anthony Hamilton, Chatham County Line, Joe Troop from Che Appalachia. We had all sorts of folks throughout the weekend, and um, we were putting, we put together content. Some of it was pre-recorded, some of it was live, and some of it was um, some of it was interviews, 
And um, it was very, it was actually uh, pretty successful. <laughs> the first night was a little rocky. We had some technical difficulties and of course we were figuring out as we went. We used um, a platform called Twitch, uh, which is used by a lot of video gamers. Um, I was new to it and it's been used for a lot of virtual content now. So moving forward, we use Twitch and Zoom. And we had a wonderful team backstage, my colleague Sam, Sam Garrett, um, along with a lot uh, some folks outside of, out uh, in Charlotte. And we were able to raise $150,000 um, total in combination with funds from the NEA to give out to artists um, throughout the state of North Carolina for artist relief. And uh, so it was a virtual music benefit concert. And so I say all that to say that that first experience that we had to put that together taught us a lot. It taught us to think outside the box because this is something that we were not used to, that we had not ever done. It taught us how to partner um, with folks that we hadn't partnered with before, uh, media partners that we hadn't partnered with before, bringing in musicians we hadn't um, ever interviewed before. And it also taught, it taught me that even folks like Anthony Hamilton, who has many, many Grammys, he was willing to give of his time and he was, he wanted to contribute to this field because these musicians are, are, are his family. North Carolina is his home. And so I learned that people are really willing to partner and willing to um, give of their time and, um, and collaborate um, even more than before. And, and I, I would encourage anyone that's thinking of virtual programming to really shoot for the moon. Everyone is sitting in their homes. <laughs> no matter how many Grammys you have, <laughs> no matter how much money you have, everybody is in the same place right now. And everyone wants, um, wants this, this world, this universe that we live in to survive um, past this time. So I would encourage everyone to shoot for the moon in that. I also would encourage for individual artists, I've um, really seen um, a lot of individual artists dive into other mediums right now. Um, country soul artist Reese Palmer is a great example of that. She has um, been working on a podcast. She has collaborated with musicians from across the country um, to be able to create new music virtually. Um, so that's an, art, that's an artist example. And I've seen lots of folks, um, Shauna Tucker, she's a cellist here in North Carolina. And she has provided a series of professional development workshops that she's provided um, to her fellow musicians on how to create virtual content. So I think for individual artists, now is the time to really dig deep and think outside the box for your own professional development, um, for your creation of new work, um, and to truly connect to your audience. Um, I would say the same for organizations. This is a time I've seen lots of organizations. Um, I've seen a lots of organizations have panel discussions and I've seen lots of organizations do behind the scenes work. Um, Theater Raleigh is an organization that, um, um, that is in Raleigh, North Carolina that has been going back in their seasons, their past seasons and bringing on cast members to um, actually virtually to actually go back and look at pre-recorded video of what they've done before and talk about the behind the scenes. This is how you really connect to an audience. You, you show you know, that the musician or the actor that you see on stage is a real person sitting in their homes, just like you and me. Um, I have seen also out in Lumberton, Car the Carolina Civic Center has a spotlight on local talent performance series where they're bringing back local talent to perform by themselves, socially distanced on their stage, and they virtually they um, put that out on the internet for folks to be able to connect to the local musicians that are there in Lumberton. 
Um, so I've seen that a lot as well, which um, I think that this is truly the time for partnership and expanding your knowledge and really connecting to your um, audience, but also connecting to other folks in your field. When it comes to, um, when it comes to resources, uh, that is another story, right? Um, and the North Carolina Arts Council, most of my days have been spent lately, but, you know, under one roof, the music festival that we put together was very fun. But mo most of our days is figuring out ways that we can uh, support financially our arts organizations across the state and also our individual artists. So we were able to change our grants, our programming grants that are typically for specific programs to operating expense grants, um, which is wonderful. So we could help a little bit um, organizations stay afloat during this time, since no one is really able to program right now. We're um, listening a lot. Um, we're um, trying to make sure that we put out resource guides and um, that we can guide organizations to other sources of funding. Um, one very innovative thing that I've seen done, um, especially with smaller and medium-sized organizations, is um, there have been a couple of situations where there have been uh, partnerships and actually um, organizations who have merged together during this time so that they can stay afloat. And that of course only happens when you have a really good relationship with another organization that has a similar, um, you know, a, a similar goal and a similar mission. Um, so I've seen that happen only a couple of times, but I do think that there's something to be said about leaning on one another and being able to, um, share resources and share knowledge and um, be able to get through this time together. So I think that's pretty much um, all of the notes that I took down to share with you all today. It's the Cliff Notes version of, um, of, of how to innovate during this time. Um, but I think just I, to leave you with just a few notes is, you know, the key words I think are innovation, creation, partnership, and support of one another during this time. Because we're all learning and we're all in this together and, um, and sharing what you learn. If something works for you as an individual artist or as an organization sharing it with the field, um, that I think is, is crucial because everyone is, really figuring it out as we go right now. Um, so I will be on here for any questions that you might have or follow up questions. Um, and that's about it. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Carly. If you have your questions for Carly, send those to us and we'll get the, to those once everyone's presented. Next up, we go to Zoe Van Buren. She is the North Carolina State Folklorist and Director of the Folk Life Program at the North Carolina Arts Council, where she administers statewide programs for traditional arts like the North Carolina Heritage Awards and the Traditional Arts Programs for Students Grant. Since 2013, she has worked with folk life organizations in New York, Massachusetts, West Virginia, and North Carolina, specializing in material culture, occupational folk life, and festivals. Before joining the North Carolina Arts Council in 2018, she worked with the Music Maker Relief Foundation, helping musicians with performance logistics and promotion, and was a contractor for the National Folk Festival during his three years in Greensboro, North Carolina. If you joined us for the first Trail Ahead webinar, you'll remember Zoe's presentation on traditional artists and folklore's social media strategies since the arrival of the pandemic. And today, she'll give a broader look into some of the other trends she has seen in traditional arts fields. Zoe, take it away. Thank you, Brandon. Um, hey, everyone. My name is Zoe Van Buren. Um, like, like was said, I direct the Folk Life Program at the North Carolina Arts Council, and that means that I work with both organizations and individual artists across our state and in all areas of traditional arts and heritage work. 
And as the state folklorist of North Carolina, that also makes me part of this national network of peers, other state folklorists working in various agencies, um, representing almost every US state. Um, so I have that sort of local, I've been kind of involved in the local scene, but also watching on a national scale. Um, and I was part of the first webinar in this series on getting creative with virtual content and social media. And in that presentation, I really tried to just reinforce to all of you that whether you're an artist or a presenter or an organization, um, that the way we use the internet right now and for the next year um, is still gonna have a really big role to play in how we are practicing, creating and sustaining communities through the arts. I mean, the internet is not perfect, but it's a real place um, and real things happen on it. And I gave some examples of places where I think I really saw artists and organizations embracing the virtual space and um, transferring traditional events and community relationships um, into Facebook groups or live stream events to remind us that, you know, it, it might be really disheartening to have lost so much right now, but there are also infinite possibilities um, and infinite possibilities for connection, which is kind of what I want to talk about today. Um, and we can really use this time to develop those relationships across this industry in new ways, um, ways that maybe we've always needed all along, actually. And it's only just this crisis that I think is um, lighting the fire under us to finally do it. So in this webinar, while we're talking about innovating new ways to connect, I, I both want to share ways I think people are making the most of that, but also um, sort of give a call to action for us to think broadly about what those new connections mean and what our roles are in the arts for this time. Um, so for myself to speak personally, even though I'm absolutely mourning the loss of you know, easy travel and face-to-face -face interactions, I'm actually finding myself more connected than I ever have been with a lot of um, peers and counterparts in other states and agencies. And this is, um, that connectivity is really our best shot right now. That's kind of our, the best tool in our toolboxes that we can get people together in these virtual spaces that actually might never have been possible before. Um, for example, right away when the pandemic hit, um, some of our national folk arts organizations really leapt into action and created this giant Zoom call to gather people um, working in traditional arts together to report out and share. Um, there wasn't even really like a clear direction at first. We kind of stumbled our way into concrete concepts and work and ended up creating working groups and project teams. And um, But it, at first it was really just this desperate effort to bring people together because we knew we were never going to rise to the challenges of this moment if we were isolated. Um, so I would say to everybody, if you have a professional network um, that you can connect with, I highly recommend finding them right now. Um, if they are not already connected, be the one to connect. Start that bi-weekly call with your closest peers. Find others who are doing what you do and really learn from each other. Um, something that's kind of coming out of uh, several of the, the work that some of my colleagues are doing um, is like a website that would act as sort of a Grand Central Station for um, information about the field our own connectivity and also um, resources and support for individual artists themselves, um, including like a great uh, event calendar that artists and organizations can submit to you so that we can all really cross pollinate um, one another's audiences nationally, because that's an option now, that's something we have now. Um, and I think this is something a lot of folks felt we needed all along, but it, it took this moment to get everyone together to actually do it. Um, and that kind of coordination is going to be more important than ever, especially if you are involved in festivals or event organizing. Um, you know, we all know festival season is right around the corner. And now that festivals and events on opposite sides of the state are going digital all within the same limited festival season time, um, it's easier than ever to sort of accidentally double book events or eat up shared audiences that might not have been shared back when geography meant anything. <laughs> um, so we really need to be connected. We really need to be collaborating to coordinate event calendars, um, support each other's programming. One really great example that I'm seeing of this is the North Carolina Folk Festival and the Piedmont Blues Preservation Society. And they, kind of like Carly said, as um, 
peer organizations decided to combine their festivals this year because they realized that they had overlapping audiences. They had precedent for the festival taking place at kind of the same time of year. Um, and that they had more to gain by pooling their resources. Um, something that might not make sense under normal operating procedure, but right now it made sense. So they're going to co-program -pro a joint festival online. Um, and they've also hooked up with this local production team in their community who had, you know, personal ties to that place and felt like a sense of duty and responsibility to um, give back to his hometown of Greensboro. So they'll be filming um, local artists and then streaming those kind of original performances uh, on social media and the internet. Um, and this is really notable that this pandemic has also been a chance for these festivals to really exclusively focus on North Carolina artists and kind of hone its mission and its relationships to the state, um, which I think wasn't really an option when there were the pressures of like the big show um, in quite the same way. And so um, I, I think there's there's silver linings like that here where I think we can we can try things that weren't really possible before with partners that maybe it wouldn't have made sense to partner with. Um, we're also seeing festivals partner with like local radio stations to get out programming beyond social media. Um, I would just say, don't forget about old media right now. I still listen to the radio all day long. Um, there's options sort of beyond streaming um, or video streaming for us too. Um, so just to go back to the idea of like the big show, I think before the pandemic, a lot of arts presenters and artists themselves had have had this experience at one point or another um, of feeling kind of caught up in the pressures of programming um, annual events that take up a lot of your time and a lot of your energy. Um, and the need to sort of put on that programming can eat into your ability as a artist or a cultural worker to really sort of dig deeper into what you're doing um, and who you're doing it with and why. Um, so if you had a major, to cancel a major event or you're trying to convert it online, I would say, you know, don't forget that there are real opportunities right now to rejigger your networks and connect with different kinds of artists and partners that um, then would normally make sense and um, think more broadly about what goes along with music. If you're, if you are a musician, is there another art form that kind of dovetails with what you do for deeper impact, um, greater sort of interpretive um, meaning and depth, uh, thinking, storytelling, history, conversations, panel discussions, like Carly said. Um, I think multimedia and multi-genre content is really uh, ripe right now because we have this sort of virtual space at our fingertips and you can kind of shift between lots of different spaces and lots of different experiences. Um, so, you know, not everybody has to be doing the same thing that fits nicely into one kind of venue size. You could have one person out in nature, one person in, you know what I mean? Like they're just, there's kind of a lot of room for creativity there. Um, so similarly, a really great opportunity right now is that it's easier than ever to get people who live really far away together in the same space. And I would take advantage of this. You know, who couldn't you book before? Who couldn't you not afford to book before because you needed to put them up in a hotel room? Um, who's of interest to your community, but maybe was too far away to travel to you before? Too unwell, too um, busy? You know, who can you advertise your events to now that things happening literally anywhere in the world are all available to everybody. Um, we've never had such a wide open audience potential. Um, so speaking personally, I find that I'm often most eager to sign up for and even pay for um, virtual lectures or panel conversations that let me experience like a discussion, a conversation that I normally wouldn't be able to travel to get to. And, um, especially right now, a lot of people are using their time to self-educate and you and the artists that you work with, the organizations you work with, you really have a chance to be educators right now. Um, there's a, a very interesting panel conversation that's happening on July 23rd by three folk arts organizations that normally, um, you wouldn't think that they would be co-sponsoring the same event because they represent different regions. Um, and are located all over the country. So the Alliance for California Traditional Arts, Southwest Folklife Alliance, and the National Council for Traditional Arts are doing 
a panel of traditional artists from all over the country um, discussing the impact that COVID has had on their work. And we get to hear this conversation between people who would rarely be in the same room together. Um, or if they were, I would probably not be within uh, a reasonable driving time to go catch it. Um, so I, I kind of have this feeling of like, oh, I'm going to commit to be there, which um, is important because we're all really aware of the risk of virtual burnout. Um, and this is something I think everybody's experiencing. Um, it's getting really hard to sort of slow the roll on the, um, you know, the, the thumb stopping, like they say with social media, it has to like stop your scrolling. Um, but we actually have this space for broadcasting deeper conversations to people who might be really hungry for them and just couldn't be there before. Um, if you think about the way that people make listen to podcasts in their own homes, like Carly mentioned, artists digging deep to find what their other skill sets are. Um, when I'm at home, my tolerance for talk goes way up because I'm not sort of sitting in an uncomfortable chair in a venue. Um, so, you know, or, or it's not somebody desperately trying to contextualize a performance in the 10 to 15 minutes of crossover time between sets um, and hoping that it gets through to the audience. Um, I think that the stuff that's cutting through right now feels kind of rare and special because it's between people who don't usually get to be together. Um, and I want to also, if I don't know how many folks were able to catch the last webinar, um, but I just wanted to speak also to what connectivity and what innovation means for organizations that do have these venues that might be feeling a little bit um, adrift right now and not really sure of what your purpose is in this world, this new world. Um, Beth Fields, who's the director of the Stokoa Valley Center um, out in Graham County, North Carolina, was on last week and she was um, explaining how they've not only used their venue as like a food collection, food bank collection site and a public Wi-Fi hotspot, but they've also been renting their space to sort of non-arts activities in a kind of unprecedented way in order to get a little revenue, including using their venue as like a um, overflow court. So um, I think that, you know, the traditional arts field has always led the way in community engaged arts, but we all know that we could do better um, at showing why artists and venues and cultural organizations are so essential to the whole community and why um, the role we play is not just sort of outside of or elite or, you know, like we're embedded. And I think thinking creat uh, creatively about your spaces, your resources can help strengthen your overall relationships in your area. Um, put your venue to good use for your neighbors. And I think that you'll be accumulating new relationships and goodwill that will help you in the future. Um, similarly, with your outreach, if you're an organization, you know, be connecting with artists to see how um, you can help them market themselves in their live events. You have a platform, maybe an official Zoom account, maybe a name, maybe a lot of followers and a mailing list, um, and vice versa. I just always encourage artists to be finding your local arts organizations, making them aware of you. Um, it might not sort of immediately give fruit, but this is a relationship that might serve you for a really long time in the future. We're always trying to like create those connections. Um, so, and those connections create trust and that's really the sort of the end goal for all of our success. Um, so that's sort of it for me. Um, I would just say the moral of the story is connect, connect, connect and don't go it alone. I mean, find, find your people, um, find your peers, find who needs you outside of who you thought needed you. Um, and and do things together. So I'll pass it back to Brandon now. Thank you, Zoe. And I'm reminded now of your question in the last webinar to, to Uwe Kruger about what arts organizations can do for artists. And he very quickly and unabashedly said, share your networks with us. Um, so sharing networks is, is, I'm glad you make that point, a, a very powerful tool for everyone right now. So next up, we'd like to welcome Ali Lee, and she's part of the Harmony Power duo Frank and Ali Lee from Bryson City, North Carolina. Their songs, learned from American folk musicians in the early days of the recording industry, are rooted in the old-time music aesthetic. Claw hammer banjo, slide guitar and harmonica blues pieces, Maybell Carter-inspired country guitar, and cross-tuned old-time fiddling, a la Fiddlin' John Carson. 
Frank and Allie, core duo of long-standing string band, the Frank Hoppers, have traveled extensively as touring musicians. Frank, a founding member of the Frank Hoppers, has impressed audiences all over the United States, Canada, and Northern Europe with his signature claw hammer sound. Allie is a founding member of the Whip Stitch Sallies, a folk band from Indiana. Together, the pair is a powerhouse duo with extensive touring experience in the U.S. and in France. In addition to performing, Frank and Allie screen print music themed t-shirts, which are available on their website, and they also organize the biannual banjo fiddle frolic, an old time music retreat in the Great Smoky Mountains. Frank and Allie's new album, Treat a Stranger Right, is now available at frankandallielee.com, CD Baby, iTunes, and Spotify. Today, Allie will speak to the quick pivots they've had to make, transitioning their annual fundraiser to a virtual event and what platforms, partnerships, and tricks have benefited this transition, as well as some of the struggles they've faced. Allie, thanks for being with us. Hey, Brandon, thank you so much for having me. Um, Frank had to... We adopted some kittens last minute this week, and uh, he's at the vet <laughs> with the kittens. So I'm here to represent us today. Um, and it's a pleasure to be here among such wonderful um, other guests who are representing all of North Carolina and the arts councils and big organizations. We're just um, do-it-yourself artists that work out of our home and are doing the best we can. Um, I totally second um, what everybody has already said about reaching out to other venues and uh, different types of other organizations. That's something that we have done that I'll talk about here shortly and something we could stand to do more of going forward too. Um, so we quickly pivoted, as Brandon said, um, there at the end of March, I think March 21st or so was our first um, lockdown live stream. We had been booked um, for a short tour in Indiana and so I contacted the venue and said hey like I know we just canceled this because everything's crazy but what if we go live on Facebook and try to raise some tips and try to help you cover your costs that you had in printing the posters and advertising for us um, and gosh, that might have been one of our best tipped shows because it was the very first one. <laughs> so, um, and people were really, people had already bought tickets, you know, all that sort of thing. So uh, that, was, that was really special. I'll go through, I have a little spreadsheet I can show you of all the different shows that we've done. But um, from, the, from there, uh, with that show, we just went live natively on Facebook with my phone and what I didn't know <laughs> What <laughs> then was that you can't go landscape on Facebook Live because you look sideways to all the viewers. So we had to learn that, that the hard way. We, we had to be portrait mode, which doesn't usually look the best. Um, probably everybody's figured that out by now, and I know you've already covered tech stuff in other webinars. But we ended up, um, we've invested in a platform called Switcher Studio that helps us broadcast and be able to be in landscape mode for Facebook. So we've learned a, lo a lot about technology um, in transitioning our shows to the virtual world. Um, so something we did after that was we were booked for a little, um, a little brewery here in, uh, we live in Bryson City, Western North Carolina. And um, we were booked there and I reached out to them and said, hey, like, you know, there's a shutdown. We could do a Facebook Live and partner with you. We could cross post to your page at the same time and um, we could, you know, just try to make the best of this. And they said, well, that's cool, but, um, you know, we don't have, we don't know how about how the money is going to work. And well, we didn't really know either because, of course, we didn't want them to pay us because that's awkward when they were losing all their money too. Uh, so what we ended up doing was <laughs> we solicited donations, as of course everyone's doing now. Um, but this brewery was so sweet. They didn't want the donations for themselves. That was what I thought we would do. I thought we would raise them some money uh, and us some money too, like maybe split it 50-50. But they said, no, like we really care about um, these nonprofits in our community. And why don't we pick one and we will have the tips go to them 
and then when, I mean, you guys try to make your guarantee like what you would have made if you had gotten to play here and everything above that can go to the nonprofit. And that was a big hit. So we took that idea and um, ran with it. So we've partnered with another venue and then that same venue to do more of that type of thing with more shows um, helping different nonprofits, mostly local ones here in our town and in our county. Um, and uh, in addition, we still kind of do our own thing, you know, different, like we'll tend to do those benefit concerts, we call them on Saturdays. And then on Fridays, we kind of, for a while, we're doing sing-alongs, we did jam-alongs, um, we had a bingo night once, like, <laughs> I made bingo cards um, with random words that I know are in a lot of our songs, and people that wanted to play bingo along with us could um, print out or just look on their phone at their bingo sheet, and every time we sang one of those words, they got to mark it off, and all the bingo winners got, like, a 5 or $10 um, gift certificate to our store. I don't know. We just... It's all about innovation these days, right? <laughs> so I'm a former seventh grade language arts teacher, so sometimes I get these crazy kind of like, kind of related to my classroom experience ideas. Um, but let me take you, just for a second, let me show you, just since we're the representing artists here, let me just show you what some of the shows are that we've done. I think I've got most of them. I don't think I got all of them. Um, this is the first one that I was talking about the first show that we did for the Harlequin Theater. We did uh, a little show for a blog called Americana Highways. It's like they were saying earlier, it's all about reaching out. So we already had a relationship with them. And when I saw that they had started a concert series, I just threw our name in the ring, you know. Uh, same with Home Roots in Canada. They're a concert series that does um, house concerts in different places in Canada. So we had been booked there. Um, and that we had actually canceled it before the shutdown for family reasons, um, but we go up, we went ahead and reached out to them and were able to do a uh, live with them, which was great. Restoration House, see all the ones in green are um, ones that were partnering with a nonprofit. So Restoration House is a nonprofit here in our community, and that was a um, in partnership with a venue that we were already booked at. This was the first one that we did. Um, and so I've just got over to this side. I didn't include <laughs> all the money that we've made because I didn't really feel like sharing all that. But for the nonprofits, I thought I'd go ahead and share how we split the money um, that came in, all the donations. Because with this one, we kept our 150 that we would have been guaranteed at the venue. And then everything else uh, got to go to that nonprofit, which we felt really good about. Paws is our local animal shelter, so we reached out and did a, um, a show with a different venue for them. This is a venue that we were already booked at, and um, so we did a show with them in Brevard. Well, in our house, but <laughs> the venue's in Brevard. The Giving Spoon is a local nonprofit, and that, that show went really well. We were able to give them over $500. And what's fun is um, thinking about how, like, and why some of these shows earned more money than others. So I can kind of share some thoughts about that in a second. But um, this, this fellow, Jamie, was someone in our community who lost part of his hand in an accident. And so um, w for that one, we didn't collect any tips ourselves. We just sent everyone to his GoFundMe page and watched the total <laughs> go up there. So that was, um, that was special. We did a couple of things here. John C. Campbell Folk School, we were already booked there, but they weren't doing that um, concert series that we were actually booked for. They were doing just what they call a morning song series. So that's one thing with artists. We kind of have to work with whatever the organizations and venues are already committed to, like whatever their plan is. Um, so we, we said, okay, well, even though we can't do our concert we were booked for, could we do something else? Like, are you doing any other series? So um, that show went really well. I, last time I looked at it, I think they had over 11,000 views on Facebook or something. And um, my little secret about that one is we actually weren't live. We pre-recorded it because uh, we didn't want to wake up that early. But <laughs> that's one of the few shows we pre-recorded. Um, most of ours have been truly live because I feel like it gets better engagement 
with uh, us being able to respond to comments. Here's that bingo night I was talking about. That was pretty fun. Not I, Probably not something I would do over and over, but it was a fun, like, one and done kind of thing. These are places in our community. Now, by this point, the word had gotten out around town that um, we were doing these benefit concerts. And so, plus, I made a post in our local Chamber of Commerce group just kind of letting folks know, hey, if you're interested in partnering with us, you know, maybe we could partner with you. So um, those folks reached out to us, and that was profitable for them and fun for us, too. What was really interesting <laughs> is that most of our, let me stop screen sharing for a second, most of our um, folks that donate to us are from all over the country because we've toured a lot, you know, and have fans that um, know about us from all over the place. And so most of the tips coming into little old Bryson City uh, organizations are from not Bryson City. And so in a way we felt really good about that. Our town is a tourist town and so much of it was shut down there for three months. Um, so feeling like we could bring in some outside income and push it back out to our local needs was helpful. Um, we feel like it was helpful to them. So let me get back to this. Um, in the intro, Brandon mentioned uh, an, an event that we put on. We do a educational event called the Banjo Fiddle Frolic. And so we, we had to cancel that in April and we went ahead and in May um, realized, well, hey, let's just try putting this online and threw it together in three weeks <laughs> and hired, I think we had 14 instructors or so. We had about, about 100 participants um, who took a, at least one workshop or who watched a concert. So um, that was really great. We way exceeded the goal that I had expected. And uh, we divided all that money kind of equally among all of our musicians based on what they did. Some of them just taught one workshop. Some of them um, led a jam. Some of them taught two workshops. Some of them did the concert. So depending on how much they wanted to be involved is how I paid them. Um, we will probably do another one of those in, in the winter time. It's, again, something you don't want to overdo. Uh, first of all, it took me a lot of work to set up, <laughs> and, um, and while I'm there, I can share a little bit about why that didn't work, or what about it, what about it didn't work. Um, let me see, am I back? Yes. So, I have, uh, we host our website on a platform called Wix, and how I set up the ticket sales was through a little app on Wix called Wix Events, which is a new app that they're, you know, releasing now. And uh, so since I'd never used it before and there wasn't a lot of information about how to use it, what I didn't know is that it didn't create any kind of spreadsheet for me about which tickets participants were buying. So I had to create that myself, which was all right. I like to have my own records anyway. But then the other thing <laughs> that was a real bummer was that I didn't know that um, all my data in that event platform would be erased after the event was over. So as soon as the event was over, like I went back to double check which workshops everyone had signed up for because I had promised them a Zoom video of each workshop they'd gone to and all the materials that were supplementary from each instructor. And it was all gone. So I, at that point, I was glad I'd made my own spreadsheet. Um, that was definitely a frustration was my ticketing platform. So that's something I would try to improve for next time. If anyone has ideas about ticketing platforms, let me know. <laughs> um, so again, we've, we've also partnered again with our local animal shelter. A radio station reached out to us. Um, that one did not go very well. And I don't know if it's because I didn't promote it enough or because we weren't truly live. That's another one that we pre-recorded because we had a conflict. Um, so that's kind of an outlier there. It's a little bit concerning but it could also and I, I don't know and the fellow even put an ad in the paper for that one so you know sometimes you just don't know maybe by that point people were getting out and about North Carolina had opened up a little bit more by that point we were part of the Mountain Spirit Acoustic Series with Louise and Scott who are coming up next in our uh, presentations and that was super fun um, I think we reached out to them because we've worked with them before um, is how that got connected 
um, Fiddler's Gathering. We were booked there with the Freight Hoppers, and so we were really excited when they reached out and said that they were doing an online version of their festival that they called the Ungathering. And uh, that's one we did with um, social, socially distant videos. We, we got to, we all picked three songs, and I already had recordings of them. And so Frank and I played along. Frank's my husband. He plays the banjo and sings. So we played along to that recording and recorded ourselves playing it. And our bassist, Amanda, also played along to the same recording in New Hampshire. And our fiddler, David, played along to the same recording in Durham, where he lives. And the, the festival itself had hired a videographer to put all the videos together. So that was really awesome because all we had to do was our part. And then we sent all of them all the videos. And I gave them the guide tracks, too, so that they had that for reference. Um, and the videographer put it together so it looked like we were all, you know, kind of in a Zoom meeting playing together. Um, so that was cool. We only did three songs, but the, the payout was great for that one. They received a whole lot of donations. So kudos to them. They did a really great job promoting um, Indiana Fiddler's Gathering. And... It's about the end of our list here. We just did a, another nonprofit for our local library, um, and that went really well. It helped. I don't want to say it helped, but our local library just had a fire, actually. So that had already been in the news around here, and people were um, anxious to share and help them anyway. So that was good. Um, kind of moving away from concerts, I just wanted to mention that we've also, just on our own, kind of tried to do some teaching online, and that's been a process also. <laughs> we started out with Frank doing some slide guitar workshops on Facebook Live, which was easy and there was no registration to deal with. We were just counting on some tips. Um, but, you know, we couldn't really interact with anyone. People were writing comments to ask questions, which I would monitor while he was teaching and I would field them to him. But it was just kind of really not the same as teaching in a classroom kind of setting. So that was before we had Zoom. Um, that didn't, wasn't too very profitable. It was fun though. Uh, so during that, someone suggested that I start a harmonica course, like a multiple series um, course on just how to play the harmonica because people were stir crazy, people were looking for things to do, and harmonica is pretty accessible. Um, so I thought, okay, so I built, <laughs> I built a course just on our website, um, seven sessions. I had 15 participants signed up, which was my goal. Not everybody ended up um, participating fully, but um, I think at least 12 of them paid at least most of what I would recommended. It was a pay what you can. So um, that, was, that was super fun and kept me really busy and uh, helped me make you know, some really good connections with people all over the country, too, that I wouldn't have otherwise. And Frank just wrapped up an intermediate call hammer banjo workshop that he did on Zoom. Um, and again, all these things, we just did pay what you can. We didn't feel like really being hard-nosed about payment with our workshops because everybody's at different places. You know, we know, like, we haven't even received our unemployment income that we've applied for or anything like that. So we're just totally relying on our patrons that we have through our website that support us monthly, and we're relying on tips that uh, we do online. We're relying on CD and T-shirt sales through our store. Um, so... Yes, innovating, <laughs> we've done a lot of. And I feel like I've talked probably longer than I was supposed to. But that's all I've got, I think, for now, unless someone has questions. That's great, Allie, thank you so much for sharing. Next up from Isis Music Hall, we have Scott Woody and Louise Baker. Scott Woody is owner and talent booker for Isis Music Hall, set in West Asheville. Isis Music Hall is a refurbished mid-century theater owned by the Woody family and operated. Their dinner and a show business model was interrupted by the COVID-19 pandemic, but in recent weeks, Scott and company have worked out uh, some alternate, alternate options. Scott's also a banjo player and a woodworking artist, and he practiced veterinary medicine in Atlanta for 30 years. Louise Baker has four and a half years experience as a talent buyer at Isis Music Hall in Asheville, North Carolina, booking approximately 150 shows a year and is the owner since 2014 of Baker Booking, representing national touring performers throughout North America. 
Being both a booking agent and a talent buyer, Louise is qualified in all aspects of booking acoustic performers. Her understanding of the importance of collaboration, promotion, and organization is well recognized and respected in the industry. Relevant credentials include songwriting judge, uh, SERFA, South Florida Folk Festival, New Song Competition, and Falcon Ridge Emerging Artists, panel member for NERFA and SERFA, from the Folk Alliance International, and host of Conference Guerrilla Showcases. Today, Scott and Louise will be talking to us about hosting socially distanced events, what strategies have and haven't worked, uh, and what they think the future might hold for live music venues. Uh, and so we will get to all your questions as soon as we've heard from Scott and Louise. Thank you both for being here today. Well, thank you, Brandon. Thank you, Brandon. I can't see myself on that screen there, so I'm not sure whether I'm on live or not because you're still up. Uh, we appreciate you guys having us. I guess we do represent uh, you know, a small business or a venue. And of course, uh, we are a restaurant and a music hall, but our, um, our business model is pretty much dependent on music. Um, we've kind of taken a look at all of this in terms of, of what we can do. And of course, we, uh, our challenges are um, the re reduced capacities, um, the safety precautions that we have to go through, um, maintaining a connection with our patrons and of course, sometimes dealing, uh, dealing with uh, criticism for actually being open. Um, we have been presenting some live music um, that we're currently doing now four days a week. To be out on our lawn. So we have, uh, we have the fortunate privilege of having a, a lawn section where we can actually uh, create some live music. Um, it's at a limited capacity, of course, uh, but that has worked quite well. Um, we have found that if we do have to bring it inside due to inclement weather, uh, that we lose about 25% of the patrons. And, and uh, one of the things that we've kind of found interesting about this that we were very concerned about was is that uh, we have a lot of what I call middle-aged demographic uh, patrons, uh, basically that are about my age is what I call middle-aged. And uh, uh, they've been very supportive. I was surprised that we were afraid that they may not come out uh, as a result of the COVID-19 uh, uh, issues, but they've done quite well. Um, we have uh, kind of diversed ourselves in terms of trying to do the virtual concert thing, as has been mentioned. Uh, Louise has been uh, setting up virtual concerts with artists such as Frank and Allie. Um, who were scheduled to play at ISIS in our lounge or on our main stage and doing those concerts live stream from the artist's home. Um, from my perspective, what I'm doing is we made an investment in a camera system, which, you know, I'll mention to you here was um, black magic uh, cinema cameras and that whole system, which is quite good. Uh, you can probably get into that for, about $12,000, so it's not cheap, but it's pretty good equipment. And for us, we kind of figured that the situation with limited capacities was going to probably continue throughout the year. So we were looking to what we might need to do in the future. Uh, we've been doing some, creating some content, uh, using those cameras with the expectations of, at least from my end here at ISIS, different than what Louise is doing uh, for us, uh, is to do some pre-recorded mixing uh, the audio and the video and presenting uh, things like our Tuesday bluegrass sessions on a regular basis, uh, maybe the best of our lawn series um, as part of uh, a continuation of, of connection with the patrons. Um, we have thoughts of maybe putting the number of bands together and creating a few uh, virtual concerts that we can present, you know, 30 minutes of each band. Um, for those that might be a little bit uh, afraid of that whole camera thing and how expensive it might be, uh, it's something that I think that most people can master pretty easily. 
and I might just take a moment just to, we did do a little bit uh, this past weekend in terms of capturing some of our long concert to, to get some content. I'm gonna skip to a screen and just kind of show you what you can do with three cameras and one person. Um, I think I'm gonna do that anyway. Ah, there it is. Is that it? Thing needs fixing up around here. I'm just gonna run them for a minute or two. Not a minute. The world is changing in the John Deere. What do you do? Got a busted pipe in the sink again. The field needs plowing and the cows need fed. Lady MacGyver. All right, how do I get out of there? There you go. All right, so anyway, we're going to take that content and those and put them together and create a, a, a best of the long concert series, do the same thing with Bluegrass Night. And I don't know how well we can monetize that. That's been the big question on these live streams. How long and how much can you monetize those? But it's not done badly so far um, in terms of the donations that uh, Louise has done. And I'll let her tell you a little bit about that. But we, we feel that if nothing else, it keeps the presence of both the musicians that we were going to have scheduled to come in, uh, as well as our venue in terms of keeping it out in front of both the artists and uh, in front of our patrons. Uh, I see Louise at you on the screen there. So you want to add something to uh, what I've said? Oh, sure. Absolutely. Um, and thank you for this opportunity, Brandon and fellow panelists. And um, yeah, I, I do echo everything that's been said by Allie and Carly and Zoe about community and connection. And what we're trying to do is kind of threefold with Isis Music Hall. I, I started out um, back in March when everything shut down, reaching out to people. And, and I said to Scott, why don't you let me just take care of this live streaming? Um, I'm pretty experienced in it because I've also done that for the artists that I represent. I've been reaching out to venues all across the country and said, you know, my artist is well um, versed in the technology would you like to do a, a live stream to partner for your venue? So that kind of made sense that I would take on many of the um, artists that we had to cancel. That's where we went first and, and then reaching out um, to other artists. And yes, there's, there's no limit for geography. I've hosted people from England. I had a fantastic guitarist um, do a live stream from Ireland the other night. He was up at 1 a.m. his time, but it gives me the opportunity to bring those folks through that normally would have booked far out to do a show at Isis Music Hall. But I'm trying to keep those going two, three, four times a week. And it really doesn't interfere with what Scott and the staff is doing with the lawn concerts. And those are at this point, mostly local people. They have to be because of the restrictions of travel now under COVID-19. And eventually we may look to holding some shows when we can be inside with social distancing and the use of the great new camera system that Scott's put together and have a show inside for either no audience or very limited audience and stream it at the same time. And, and yes, the monetizing the ticket um, links, what ticket service that's still a big question um, to all kinds of people. And so most of what I've been doing right now um, has been by donation. And we have asked if the artists will be willing to chip in a little of that tip jar back towards the survival of Isis Music Hall, and, and they have been. And we have done on every platform from Facebook Live to Twitch to Zoom, which I really like because it's very interactive. And you know, sometimes um, th these folks are making a couple hundred dollars. Sometimes it's much more, it really varies. Um, one of the things in, in terms of innovation that I've thought about recently is the um, connection that 
the artist and the venue have to make not only with the local community, but the wider community. And in that this area is a tourist area. And as, as Ali said, Bryson City is, and certainly Asheville is. Many of the patrons that have come to Isis Music Hall and played our series come from all over the country. We need to reach out to them wherever they are and ask that they support us because when they're going to come back here for vacation, they want to have Isis Music Hall still be open. And something that I came up with, um, I, you know, the concept of a street team. When the club was open, artists would send posters ahead of time and ask <clears throat> if we had someone available to spread them around the community. And I'm trying to sort of generate this buzzword of a virtual street team where a venue or more often a performer can reach out to a special top fan of theirs and say, hey, you know, you might know some folks in your book club or in your community or through other connection that has no idea that the arts are being presented online. And I think that's something that we're missing. Um, we're all talking to each other. We're all in the same choir on Facebook and in these webinars, but we have to make the greater community know that they can see various types of artists and performers live screen. And even if they are, don't have a Facebook account, they can get a link and watch a Facebook live. They can learn how to, to use Zoom. So I think that's very important that people reach out and try to build the audience so that they're knowledgeable about these things. And, just building community, I think, is very important. Um, another thing is to have um, your tip jar be kind of your virtual merch table. Um, I haven't seen too many performers. A Allie did a, a great job when she did our show because she had all her CDs handy and she held them up. I think it's very important for the performers to encourage the um, audience to go and visit their website and support them that way. So I think right now with um, what we're looking at in, in this state, um, we're being careful, which I appreciate. You know, we all need to stay healthy and get through this, that live streaming is really important. And if we can combine that with some, you know, small capacity shows as we're able, if we're able to open, uh, learning the technology, communicating with our peers. I too have found that I can reach lots of people now that I wasn't able to reach before because it doesn't matter if you're a small booking agent talent buyer as my experience is, or you run Passim or the ARC. I even had a wonderful conversation with the director of the Arts Northwest and she wanted to know how to do live streams and how to do showcases. Uh, one last little idea I'm kind of doing more associated with my booking agency is to do a uh, showcase series where we invite five artists to come on one night. Um, it's, it's not on the Mountain Spirit page, it's a side project, but it's kind of showcasing. So instead of going to an NERFA and SERFA, we call them NERFA and SERFA, they are regional conferences for folks where you get to see each artist perform for 15 or 20 minutes sometimes in a, a hotel um, lobby, sometimes in a small room, but it gives presenters, and, and I'm sure there are some watching now, the opportunity to hear a lot of musicians at one time. So that's something else you can do on Zoom. So uh, yeah, I, I agree with um, everyone that we have to build community, we have to stay innovative and aware and support each other um, and share and help. And I'm really looking forward to seeing what happens next and hope everybody stay healthy and thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Thank you very much, Louise. We've got a couple questions around, but we welcome any more that anyone has. Uh, one of the first, and I think Zoe, uh, you approached it in the chat here, um, but I'll open it up to anyone. Um, and there was a question if, if there's a central event calendar anywhere and I, I know we're working with people who uh, focus on the entire state and working with some people who focus on the western part of the state so it's possible uh, that there could be multiple calendars going on but does anybody know have a good handle on a central event calendar okay 
Okay, so as soon as we find that, we'll share that with you. A great idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's uh, something we can take and, and work on when we move yeah. move away from this afternoon. Um, Scott, Ali sent a question in. Uh, are you doing the camera edits in post or in real time? Well, actually, both of them. Uh, at ISIS, when we record a show, we are actually recording it, taking it to post-production, mixing the audio and the video. But we're also taking that, at least the last one that we just did with Mark Bumgardner, which you might be able to see on our Facebook page. Um, the actual concert was recorded, pre-recorded, and then we broadcast it on OBS to Facebook to both Mountain Spirit, to ISIS, and to Mark Bumgarner's page. And then we had a, uh, a live interview section. So we're still working on the format, but the, the live inter interview portion with Mark and I was actually through our switcher, which we have a Blackmagic TV Pro switcher. And I'm familiar with the... Uh, uh, the other switcher studio. I, I looked at that one. Uh, so we're doing both of them. It's very difficult to do the switching uh, and get the timing right when you're doing it live. Um, I mean, it's just tough to do. Uh, you, you, you don't know, you want to, you want to be in time with the music and you want it to do with between phrases and, and verse course, whatever. Uh, and I'm, probably too OCD to do that. Honestly, I've got to have it done in another way. So we're kind of combining the two. And I suspect when Louise does something with multiple cameras, that those switchings are taking place live in real time. Uh, so we're actually doing both. Um, but good luck with the live switching because it's not as easy as, as, as doing post-production. No, I, I can't pull it off for us. We don't have anybody else in the house that could push the button, you know, so... It's just Frank and I, and we both got our hands full. So, <laughs> so we just have the one camera. Well, yeah. some of those actually do have an automatic switcher that you can set up so that oh, it's really? on a time code of every 15 seconds. Of course, it, it switches. You might be in the middle of a sentence or something, but nonetheless, you can set it on automatic if you have two cameras going. Oh, that's fancy. <laughs> yeah, you can figure out how to do it, right? <laughs> So Naomi Riley um, asked if Visit NC has a centralized calendar, and I don't know the answer to that, but that definitely would be a good place to look. Um, or Allie, uh, can you talk about introducing a ticket price for streamed events? Any success or comments about how to make it work? So the only time I did actual ticketing was for our virtual banjo fiddle frolic event and that was set up through our website which is hosted by a uh, web host called wix w-i-x and within wix there's lots of options i had as to how to set it up i could have made it all through our store app i could have made it through like some kind of job form or external thing and embedded it um, but instead I used an app that they had introduced on Wix called Wix Events that they had a ticketing feature. But I, unless they do some upgrades, I wouldn't necessarily recommend it because the way I wanted to do it was I wanted to have a different ticket for each workshop that people were signing up for um, so that I could, um, you know, let people be flexible and come to whichever workshop they wanted to. And um, it didn't create a spreadsheet for me automatically as far as who was buying what tickets. And then also, as soon as the event was over, all the data got deleted. <laughs> so unless they do some updates, I would not recommend that. Um, you know who you might check out is Brad Kolodner and Kathy Fink. They are also doing some online workshops. And um, we were part of their online banjo festival, the first one that they did. And so they are doing some ticketing. Um, and they used some different ticketing uh, platform that I was not familiar with, but I was creeping on what they were doing and noticed that they were doing something. So, uh, other than that, all we for our concerts, we're just simply asking for donations. I said it us. We have a PayPal, like a dedicated PayPal link, paypal.me forward slash Frank and Alley. So that is the first one that I list because most of our people are familiar and comfortable with PayPal. I also put it in 
the video, like the actual picture, because with the broadcaster we use, Switcher Studio, I can put video overlays. So I put like the name of our event that we're streaming, the name of our concert, and then I put how to donate, the Frank and Alley PayPal link. Um, but I also put like our Venmo and a link to our tip jar that's through our website for credit debit cards, um, Google Pay, Cash App. Like <laughs> the more ways you give people to donate, the better. Um, but yeah, I haven't done actual ticketing for concerts. Thank you, Allie. Uh, another question, uh, and, and this has been talked about a little bit so far, but are folks experiencing video fatigue? How do you keep it interesting on a long form event? I kind of like to um, speak to that one because I very much sympathize with that feeling. Um, I spend a lot of my day staring at a computer screen and it leaves me with limited resources left over at the end for sort of um, fun things that I'm doing on the internet. So I think that there's two different ways you can think about it. I mean, one method that reduces video fatigue is creating events that don't require looking quite as much where you could have something playing in the background and your eyes could be elsewhere and you would, you know, you would still be listening to conversation or music. Um, the al other alternative is sort of to go hard in the opposite direction, which I think our, our, uh, under One Roof Festival that Carly spoke about did really well, in which was that it programmed a really diverse range of kinds of content. And so you would go from like a pre-recorded um, uh, sort of archival video to a intimate live Zoom performance to even, you know, <laughs> Petey Pablo cooking in his backyard. And <laughs> And it just, it breaks up your, your experience. It allows you to, you know, if, if somebody's not really feeling it, it tells them that there's something, if they want to check out and come back in five minutes, the content will have shifted a little bit. So it just gives you variety. It, it just helps with that exhaustion. Um, and I think another third component is really important to think about is um, investing in higher quality uh, production gear because I remember really early on in this whole thing, um, seeing an article that was explaining why we all feel so tired on video chat. And it made so much sense to me. It said that, um, you know, when you're looking at the, at the natural world, um, your brain does fill in these sort of micro gaps in, our, in the visual and audio, uh, audio input that we're experiencing in the world. Um, but they're so tiny as to be almost imperceptible. So our brain doesn't have to do a lot of work to stitch the experience together into like a seamless um, vision or, or heard experience. But on the internet, um, there's lags, there's way lower sort of frame rates than your eye sees in reality. And so your brain is working on quadruple overtime to seam together what you're experiencing. Um, and that actually wears on you, <laughs> like that physically tires you. Um, and I think that that's a good reason to, uh, to invest in higher quality video and audio um, materials because I, I really think it will literally lengthen the amount of time that you can um, take up somebody's mental energy without exhausting them. So um, a lot of different things you can do, but I think that's just really smart to be mindful of the fatigue um, and mindful of the way that people are spending their lives on video chat before they even arrive at your live event. And so they might have very little left in the fuel tank for your event. And what can you do to kind of um, reignite the spark of interest? Thank you, Zoe. We have a couple yeah. questions uh, for Scott and Louise. Uh, in question, um, are you selling tickets in advance for your lawn shows? Um, how are attendants and are people being careful, meaning attendees? Uh, yes, we are selling tickets in advance. We started off by uh, doing a charge on the dinner bill of a, a $10 entertainment fee. But what we, we have a limited amount of space. So we have like 23 tables and they're all six feet apart. And what we found is there were a couple of shows where people made reservations and then just didn't show up. So we had four tables or more, um, up, which ended up being about 20% of, you know, what we were able to do. 
so we went to selling tickets in advance. So we're actually using our regular ticket service now when people call, it's all by reservation and they have to buy a ticket when they make the reservations. And yes, they've been well attended. Um, the pretty much all of them have sold out except when we've had inclement weather and had to move it in indoors. The clientele, the patrons have been very good. We require a mask to and from the table. Uh, they can take the mask off when they're at the table, but as soon as they get up and we've had very rarely have we had to remind anybody that they needed to put their mask on. Um, so the folks that we are dealing with have been really quite good about, of course, our staff wears masks all the time during the whole process. Um, so it, it seems to be a very safe environment and people are, are showing up for it. Now they're starved for live entertainment. So they're really thrilled to be outside and watching a show. So the outside concert thing's working great. If we could just get the weather to stay good all the time. Thank you, Scott. This is a, a larger question for everyone from our friend Sandra Davidson at the North Carolina Arts Council. She'd love for, for you to respond to reflect on how you feel about the sustainability of the new strategies you've developed. Um, so what is it that you're doing right now that you can see carrying forward in whatever a post pandemic world looks like? Well, I guess I would just say that the live streaming I think is going to go on even post pandemic is pe people are going to find that they can watch things all around the country that they wouldn't be able to get to. And if, if they don't have the means to travel, they'll still be able to watch a good show. And if, as people ramp up on their technology and become more comfortable with that, yeah, everybody wants to go out and be at an actual show. But I, I think this is going to keep going for a long time. You see the, the large larger scale music artists are using it. So I do believe that us all having a good handle on this and making that grow is, is going to keep going on. I think for artists, um, I, I will say um, I'm, I'm a theater artist and I've participated in quite a few um, quite a few new play um, readings with uh, playwrights from New York and all over the place. So it's really expanded my pool of um, folks to collaborate with. And when pre in preparing for this today, when I was talking to Reese Palmer, she was explaining, she did something similar to what you did, Allie, um, and collaborating with someone from, well, this person was in LA, but they recorded different parts and they put it all together to make it look like they were all together. <laughs> but she was explaining that she thinks that after this, uh, and this thing ends, that that kind of collaboration will continue um, or the, the pool of, of artists and musicians that folks can um, create with, um, that part will probably sustain through this because it's just been so cool for people um, to experience that. So I, I think that part definitely will stick around. Any other we're ideas? Gonna, we're gonna have to start learning not only how to do virtual events, but how to do hybrid events that are both in person and accessible virtually because we might end up with sort of a half year period where, you know, maybe half the, half of your community is comfortable being there in person and the other half isn't and you don't want to lose them. Um, but also, like Carly was saying, to sort of continue reaping the benefits of how wide, how big our worlds have gotten in some ways. Um, I think that we are going to never want to forget these skills, but also adapt them so that we're creating seamless experiences that are um, meaningful and you know nicely planned in person but also translate to being streamed out to the larger world thank you zoe and scott well i do i do think the streaming is going going to continue on the research and looking at that is how that would be accepted there were there was a lot of commentary on the fact that even if people don't watch all of the stream or they just kept portions of it. As far as say a music venue or any venue uh, for that matter, 
that the likelihood of them showing up at your venue at some time in the future was there. So even if you're not able to really monetize it to any great degree, um, it certainly becomes one of those forms of promotion that you can put out there to brand yourself and make, make your venue or your artist uh, uh, present within, within the, the patrons. Um, we plan on doing that even after this is done. We've been meaning to get a camera system for a long time. It's, the thing is with the COVID-19, it pretty much puts you in a situation where I had to go ahead and do it. You know, I'd always debated about getting it, wanted to get the camera system, and then it was just like, okay, well, now I have to get it. But that was the intent all along, was to try to do some type of, of video production. And I think we will do streaming in front of a live, you know, studio audience or pre-recorded in front of a live studio audience and put it out there because your reach is so great with that, that even people who are going to come to Asheville who might be viewing those things on YouTube or Facebook or somewhere else because they're on the internet. Um, you know, it, it does help us in terms of branding us as to what kind of music that we have here at ISIS. So I would say, yes, it will continue. At least we will be continuing to do it regardless. Brandon, can I say something? Absolutely, Wayne. Yeah, I, so, you know, just to kind of look uh, at the big picture here for the Arts Council, for f it's a 50-year-old agency. And for 50 years, um, part of our mission was to try to encourage the, uh, the, the development of the, and support the, the idea of the profession, the artist profession, and that that was, um, that was an essential role or an essential occupation within society. And I think, you know, we've done a really, in, in a way, a really good job. I mean, it was, it's been a national trend. I, I think, though, what we're going to have to deal with going forward is, um, you know, is is the question of whether um, we continue to encourage people to be full, you know, professional artists full time. I think what's the, the question that's being called is whether people can actually um, do that, you know, especially young, you know, they're, they're folks who are established, they're probably going to be able to hopefully hang on uh, and continue to do it. But for people who are coming, um, you know, into um, their early careers, you know, how do we counsel them? And, and I want to debate that going forward and whether we start to uh, encourage people to build creative lives for which playing music is an essential part of that, but it, you can't expect everybody who wants to be a professional musician to be able to do that because the, the, the business model doesn't work any longer. So I, I think that we re really um, are going to be grappling with that in the future. And some, um, some places have already been thinking about it. The Keenan Institute for the Arts, for example, um, ha has been looking at that question. How do, you know, the School of the Arts turns out really, really uh, amazing uh, young artists, but they're real, they, they see that many of those people cannot um, sustain themselves in careers like that. So we're at a, at a kind of a transitional point. So it's gonna be interesting to see, and in some ways we may go back uh, you know, I started out with my comments by saying when we went, came into the Blue Ridge region, you know, in the 80s and 90s, we were seeing this wide range of people who play music for different motivations, and, but there, it was a high quality, and, and we may end up seeing that again. Thank you, Wayne. Uh, I think we'll get to one last question because it's very connected to what you just said. Uh, Pam has said... I've just switched careers and, and am looking forward to performing. Any suggestions on how to get started and network? I'm practicing and trying to figure out how to market my performance. I'll open that to everyone.
Well, I would say um, you, you need to create some promotional content. Well, besides being good, uh, that if you're trying to be booked in venues, that we get all types of, of uh, lots of requests. And as Louise can tell you, uh, there's a lot of variation in the quality of that, that uh, content that people uh, submit to us, which is also one of the other reasons we were thinking the camera and the system that we have, if we're recording it, we can also help artists create content because honestly, there are a lot of them whose video is an iPhone turned the wrong way, as Ali had mentioned earlier. And it's very difficult to make an assessment as to whether uh, you're any good or not when you can't even hear the audio on your video. So we get all kinds of stuff. So concentrate first on making sure you've got a good promotional package and some good content that you can present to folks and then just present what they need in terms of, you know, where have you played? You know, how much are you charging? Do you need a guarantee? What is your expected draw? All those things that usually take about five emails to ascertain from an artist as to whether or not uh, they can play in your venue. Now, I don't know how that applies to uh, performing arts centers. I mean, I don't know if emerging artists play there that hadn't already reached a certain level, but for, for us regular venues, um, you know, good promotional content is really important because we can't market you if your stuff looks like poo. That's word I can say there. Uh, so anyway, that's my two cents worth on that. Um, and I'll mute myself now. Carly? Um, I will say um, I had a voice teacher once when I was um, in college um, I was a music major and she, I was ready to get on out into the world and she's, and I was ready to make my website and everything. And she was like, well, hone your skills first <laughs> and, and, and then promote and then promote. So, you know, now uh, we are in this, in our houses and we are sheltering in place. So hone your craft as much as you can. And then, and then the beauty about being in our, um, how homes right now in this whole virtual world is that I've seen a lot of people cre creating music and just putting it out there, right, um, for the world. And so once you get to a certain level, then yes, um, you know, Ali mentioned Wix. Um, Wix is a great way to go ahead and make a website. Squarespace is another great way to make a website. Um, but to get that promotional um, content that Scott's speaking of that is so important to be able to package yourself in a professional manner um, so that when we are out of our houses <laughs> that and, and you can be booked in a, in a venue um, you know and, and, and there's much more opportunity for that then you, you'll be ready for that so um, um, piggybacking on what Scott said about creating content um, now is is really crucial and there's lots of tools to be able to do that um, as far as performing arts venues goes, there is um, the North Carolina Presenter, Presenters Consortium, um, which is a, partners of, a partner of ours. Um, they are uh, just like us, trying to figure out this new world and navigating things. Um, but that is um, an organization that connects lots of different performing arts venues to one another throughout the state of North Carolina. And um, they, um, actually every other year host um, a showcase of um, all sorts of different musicians, some of them from outside of North Carolina, but a good percentage because of our partnership with them are from North Carolina. So that would be a great goal for you um, to work towards um, and introducing yourself maybe, you know, and being preparing yourself to be able to audition for that and get yourself out there. But as Scott said earlier, you know, getting yourself professionally packaged to be able to do that, because NCPC, the Presenters Consortium, is would say the same thing that he just said, which is, you know, come with really good content um, that's clear and professional and um, and uh, and original and and connects to to your audience as well. So, honing your craft is the first step, and then and then packaging and then networking. I would say. Um, 
but that's a good resource. I'll put it in the chat um, in CPC's website so you can check it out. Thank you, Carly. Zoe? I just wanna follow up on that too and kind of tie it back into what Wayne was talking about um, with the difficulties with the sort of um, full-time artist business model right now. Um, that similarly, I think identify what other skills you have that are related to being an artist beyond just the performance. So um, are you somebody who is capable of facilitating a panel conversation? Can you run a webinar? Can you um, interview people? Can you do field work? Can you, what, you know, think about sort of, are you a teaching artist? Are you good with kids? Can you get certified for other things? Um, to kind of diversify the number of things that somebody might be interested in coming to you for. And that way you're not kind of just putting all your eggs into one basket of possibility for what you can do professionally. Um, and similarly with arts organizations, I think a lot of people in the arts are asking a very similar question of, of organizations of, um, you know, what, and, and we're kind of contemplating that too at the Arts Council is like, where are all the different kinds of spaces where the arts take place? Um, how can we maybe think a little bit more broadly about what it means to be an arts organization? Um, how can, how are people going to have to be maybe diversifying revenue streams or better connecting with their community by thinking um, through the arts, but beyond the arts too, so that, uh, they are kind of relevant and, and connected um, to everybody. So it, it's just a, it's kind of a check-in time, I think, for all of us. And, and um, Ali just wrote in the chat, wearing a lot of hats, and, and you do have a lot of hats, and every organization has the capacity to wear a lot of hats. Um, and I think ideally the arts are not this sort of siloed experience, right? Like the arts are everything. And, and, and I think that we need to think about what skills and what capacities and what perspectives all of us who work in the arts can bring um, to everything in this in this world and, and to really make sure people know how to work with us and and make the most of what we can do. Thank you very much Zoe. I'll see if anybody else has got anything to share and if not we will wrap up for today. I'd like to thank First Citizens for sponsoring this webinar series. I'd like to thank the North Carolina Arts Council for their invaluable partnership in terms of content and technological help. And a big thank you, big round of applause to each of our panelists for being with us and sharing their expertise and taking their time uh, today. Please, if you're watching, complete the survey. If you're on Zoom, as soon as you close your window, you should have a link um, or the window should pop up with the survey. If you're in Facebook, you've got that link in the chat. Um, we appreciate any feedback you have. We are looking to do more of this this year. So if you have ideas about future webinar topics, please share those with us. And otherwise, thank you to everyone. Um, we're with you. I'll also note um, the Blue Ridge National Heritage website and the Blue Ridge Music Trails website. Uh, both of those have event calendars. They may not be as central as, all, as what we're talking about being there, but they definitely focus on the western part of the state. So please look to our resources and let us know if there's any way we can help you in this time. So wishing everyone the best. Uh, we'll sign off today. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you, Brandon. Brandon.